Hi everyone and welcome to Module 3, Common Data Management Documents. For this module I've prepared two PowerPoint lectures. In the Part 1, we will cover the most common types of documents you'll encounter when performing data management for a clinical trial. In Part 2, we will discuss the edit check documentation in depth. We're going to start by discussing the purpose of data management documents. Why do we need them and how are they used? Next, we'll talk about the most common documents that we find and retain in our data management study file. We'll also spend some time talking about the process of creating, maintaining, and retaining these documents. And we'll focus on the content of the data management plan as well as the content of the task specific plans. After that, we'll move into a discussion of specification documents with an emphasis on the edit check specifications. And finally, we're going to chat briefly about risk-based monitoring, or RBM, what it is and how it impacts both data management and clinical groups. So what is the purpose of data management documents and why do we create them? Well, the Society for Clinical Data Management notes, every clinical study should have a data management plan to ensure and document adherence to good clinical data management practices for all phases of a study. Although the clinical data manager will not personally perform all the tasks or prepare all the sections of the data management plan described in the chapter, the data manager should ensure all of these tasks and sections are completed according to good clinical data management practices. A data management plan or a data handling plan, it simply documents the data management activities that are going to be conducted for a specific project. In particular, you want to think about compliance with both good clinical practice or GCP, the protocol, and the contract. There are no regulations requiring a data management plan. However, the use of the data management plan and its documentation is considered general practice within our industry. Sponsors and auditors will expect you to have a data management plan. Furthermore, they'll expect the plan conforms to the general format proposed by the SCDM. Proshka provides a DMP outline, including the elements recommended by the SCDM, in Appendix A. For most of you, that's going to be pages 235 and 238 of your textbook. You're going to be assigned to read through that and get familiar with it. We also want a data management document because of consistency issues. If there's no regulatory requirement, why are the data management plans the industry standard? It's because many people will work on or with the data for a project. In order for that data to be consistent, it needs to be handled consistently. The data management documents outline how the data is going to be managed so that every member of the data management team will be following the same procedures. We also need just general documentation. The data management plan is going to document the data was handled in accordance with good clinical practice. For example, a quick review of the plan can provide evidence that access to the data was limited to trained and authorized individuals. And remember, studies can take years to complete. Often data management staff leave their positions or the project prior to the completion of the study. Or a study may go dormant for some time, only to be accessed again years after the data management is complete. In both cases, staff new to the study will be utilizing the data management plan and the data management documents to determine how the data should be and was handled. So what are some common data management documents? Well, I want to talk about four broad categories. The first is Standard Operating Procedures, or SOPs. We'll discuss SOPs in depth in Module 9, but for this module, it'll help you to understand what an SOP is and how it differs from department guidelines or project-specific documents. SOPs are Standard Operating Procedures. SOPs are required by ICH E6, Section 5.1.1, which states that the sponsor is responsible for implementing and maintaining quality assurance and quality control systems with written SOPs. And I've just got a little graphic image here of part of an SOP, so you can sort of see the bits of information on it. We also have Department Operating Procedures, or DOPs. Sometimes these are called work instructions or guidelines as well. DOPs are not required by ICHE6, 
but many companies find it useful to create documents that detail the processes utilized to perform the tasks required in the SOP. Why two different documents or level of documents? Well, SOPs typically require very strong change control procedures. Modifying or deviating from an SOP requires stringent review and approval. So you want to limit the information you've got in an SOP so you're not constantly having to update the document in order to reflect a change or a current practice. Now DOPs can be modified and approved at a department level. This means they can be more detailed and are often used as the basis for training documents. And then we have project specific documents. The data management plan is a good example. It's not an SOP or a DOP. Remember, SOPs and DOPs outline procedures which are used for all projects. But each project is going to have unique tasks and data handling needs that are dictated by the protocol and analysis plan. So a cardiac study may use data from a central lab, while a phase two oncology trial may be receiving pathology reports from small local pathology labs. The data management plan and the documents it contains are going to handle the specific procedures needed for that unique study, such as handling the lab data. And then we have contractual documents. Unless you're working for a sponsor or a researcher who's handling all aspects of the trial themselves, you're going to find yourself contracting to work with other individuals or companies. There will be written documents that outline the work to be done, the time frame it has to be done in, and who's responsible for each task. This may be a master service agreement between a sponsor and a CRO, or a site contract, or the project scope of work. While I don't have a full contract for our MARC trial, I did create an abbreviated scope of work. I'm going to be posting a copy of the full document in our data management study file folder. We'll use this document when preparing our data management plan and for other activities throughout the course. Here's a quick screenshot that'll show you just the title and scope sections. Let's take a deeper look at the Data Management Plan, or DMP. The Data Management Plan needs to address the work that will be performed, who will do that work, what SOPs or guidelines are going to apply, and what documentation or output will be produced or collected. Proshka includes an excellent outline of a comprehensive Data Management Plan in Appendix A. So you'll be reviewing that again as part of your assigned reading, but as a quick reference, the DMP should include all of these items. It should address CRF creation, database design build, edit check specs, database testing and release, workflow, document control, data entry, data review, etc. By the way, those of us in clinical trials research Use the term data management plan to refer to the documents describing how we build and manage the clinical trials database. But I want to point out that the term has a slightly different meaning if you're working in general research or non trials research. Most government and nonprofit funded research requires that the investigator or researcher develop a plan for sharing their data with other researchers. This plan is also referred to as the data management or data sharing plan. I've included a screenshot of the National Institute of Health's Required Data Management Plan element section. You can see that both types of DMPs require documentation of data handling, but the NIH plan requires documentation on how the data is going to be shared, and particularly how patient confidentiality will be assured during that sharing process. There are regs that bind both the investigator and the sponsor to retain documents that basically tell you important facts about the study that they're running. In addition to that, many companies have standards for creating, maintaining, and retaining all study documents. Many companies are going to document these standards, again, in an SOP. Make sure you know the standards for your company. But there are some industry-wide best practices that you should be aware of. Try to use a standard format. Most companies have templates in place for common documents. I'll post a sample of some template documents used by nonprofit data management groups so you can see what I mean. Some templates simply provide a shell with common section headers. Other templates include prompting text to remind you what needs to go in each section. First and foremost, study documents need to be in place prior to starting the work. 
In other words, you don't write the data entry instructions after you've entered all the patient data. Instead, you write the data entry instructions before you begin entry, and then you update them as you add new policies. It's given that at some point you're going to need to modify or update your study documents. When that happens, you'll need to implement some version control. Essentially, you need to be certain every team member is using the current version of the document, not an old, outdated, or superseded one. You also need a plan for retaining the documents you produce. The plan needs to state what's going to be retained, how it's going to be retained, for example, hard copy or digital, where it will be retained, and how long it will be retained for. Two years? Five years? Is it after the end of the study or after the product's approved? For example, your company might have an SOP that lists all data management documents that must be retained and that states they'll be retained as hard copies in an environmentally secure access controlled location for a period of three years after the approval of a product. Another company might have a different set of standards. Here are two text examples from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease Division's record retention policy just to give you a taste for what people look at. Let's talk a little more about version control. First, version control is hard, but it's important. Imagine what would happen if each team member was working from a different version of the data review plan. The result would be inconsistency and, you know, frankly, chaos. We avoid this by adding text to each document that identifies what version it is. The version number should appear on every page of the document. For our mock trial, I put the version number in the header along with the date. Some companies like to put the version number at the bottom of each page. Just make sure you have it on every page. Here are a few examples of various approaches to documenting version number. You can see some are in the header, some in the footer, some include the date, some don't. Once you have each version identified, you need to make sure you distribute the new version to every team member and collect all copies of the superseded versions. Again, this is harder than it sounds, but it's important. Some companies go so far as to prohibit printing of hard copies of project documents. That allows them to ensure only the newest version is available online. But you need to keep at least one copy of the old version and archive it as part of your overall study documentation. Again, I know I say this a lot, but make sure you know what the SOPs for version control are for the company where you're working. I want to start by describing the difference between the data management study file and the trial master file. You'll discuss the trial master file in depth in your monitoring class. Essentially, it's a file that contains all the clinical and regulatory documents pertaining to the conduct of the study. The data management study file contains only those documents relevant to data management. It's considered a best practice for data management groups to establish and maintain a data management study file. There's no regulatory requirement for this, but the industry expectation is that the common documents we've discussed will be maintained in this file. At the end of the study, the contents of the data management study file may often be transferred to the trial master file. We'll be building our own simple data management study file as we work through our mock trial. I'll be creating a tab on Blackboard titled CLR Mock 001 Data Management Study File. As we work through each module, I'll upload the relevant documents that we use and create. As I noted earlier, in today's world, we usually find ourselves working with vendors or sponsors rather than handling a trial on our own within a company. This means that we're going to have some contractual documents in place, and as a team member, you need to know what those are and how they're used. Let's talk first about the need to document responsibility for a task. We can extend that concept of documenting responsibilities to the contractual agreements between sponsors, sites, vendors, and CROs. In fact, these contract documents, along with the protocol, form the foundation for the scope of the project. The essential information in all of these documents is, again, who is responsible for doing what. Let's talk about the master agreement. If a sponsor plans to work frequently with a vendor, they may negotiate a master agreement that outlines the general expectations that will be in place for all projects the two work on. For example, the master agreement might say the sponsor requires records be retained for five years. That would be a requirement for any study the sponsor does with you. The individual project contracts could refer to the master agreement. 
I've included a link to the master agreement between Wyeth Pharmaceuticals and the University of Texas. You don't have to read this in depth, but scan it to get a feel for what a master agreement looks like. What's a request for proposal? Essentially, the sponsor provides a description of the work they'd like done, and a CRO or vendor responds with a proposal for doing that work. You'll also hear this called an RFP or RFI, Request for Information. I've included a link to an RFP from NIDA. Scan this again to get a feel for what an RFP looks like. What about a contract? Well, the contract outlines the agreement to perform the work. It typically includes a scope of work document, like we discussed before, detailing who does what, when it has to happen, and what it's going to cost to do it. So the scope of work includes a section that provides details on what tasks need to be performed and what it needs to be done. The image on this screen is from the scope of work document we'll be using for our mock trial. The budget lays out the number of hours and dollars allocated to perform each task. Project team members are responsible for monitoring the budget and letting the project manager know if they appear to be going over the contracted hours. By the way, Norman Goldfarb has produced a nice short article titled Sponsor Agreements with Research Sites and CROs. I want you to read the whole article. It outlines the different contracts used by the sponsor when dealing with CROs and investigators. The term specification or specification document refers to a written list of the required elements for a process, program, or system. Specifications are very common data management documents. In data management, we most often produce specification documents for the database, ad hoc or standard reports, and the edit checks. Specifications outline what you want to do and how you need to do it. Here's a snippet from a relational database spec document. A database spec document might also say that the database has to support remote data entry, for example, or allow export of data into Excel format. Report specs might say that the report needs to run on all unverified data and that it'll include specific fields or that it's programmed to run automatically every Friday night at 11 p.m. and that the output must be in a table format. Specifications are simply a way to communicate expectations and reduce confusion and they also force us to think through what we really want to do. Yes, we know we want to enter the patient identifier, but what will that identifier look like? What attributes should the field allow, and what ranges should we put on it? In this course, we're going to focus on the edit checks and the edit check specifications document, more so than the database specs or the report specs. We're going to be using edit checks later in the course to practice generating and resolving data discrepancies. I've attached a screenshot from the edit check specs document we'll be using. We won't go into detail in this part one lecture, but the part two lecture will focus exclusively on edit checks. Why are we discussing risk-based monitoring, or RBM, in a data management course? Well, there are two reasons. First, clinical trial management is a cross-functional process. Managing a trial effectively requires that each function or department have an understanding of how the other groups work. This allows them all to make informed decisions about the best way to manage the work. So data managers need to understand what RBM is and how it impacts the monitoring process. Secondly, RBM emphasizes using programmatic review of the data to identify risks and trends. In some companies, the RBM checks are being done within data management. In other companies, CRAs are doing the checks, but they're doing so using the data management systems. Your assigned rating for this module includes the FDA guidance on risk-based monitoring. The guidance does a nice job providing examples of the types of remote checks that should be done. Regardless the role you end up performing, you need to be aware of the goals of risk-based management and how data management can support them. So the key concepts involved in risk-based management, according to the guidance, are risk assessment. Identify what data is most important. Not all data is worth checking because not all data is critical. Routine review. Identify and follow up on missing, inconsistent, and outlier data. And don't wait until study completion to do it. Do it on a routine basis throughout the study because then you can prevent issues rather than just cleaning them up after the fact. Also. 
review for protocol deviations that may indicate systemic or significant errors at the site, and review for trends in ranges, consistency, and completeness of data. Also, review for unusual distribution of data within and between sites, such as too little variance or data that's too clean or too dirty. All of those can indicate duplication of patient data or falsification of patient data. Review site performance metrics, high screen failures, high withdrawal rates, high error rates. Also, look for metrics that are too good. Again, that can indicate that the patient data is being made up. Before you move to the Part 2 lecture, I recommend you read Proshka's Chapter 1, The Data Management Plan, and look at Appendix A, The Data Management Plan Outline. Also, read the guidance for risk-based monitoring in depth. This is something you're going to need to know and use. Watch the two videos I have posted and do a quick scan on the RFP and the data management template documents. And then I'd like you to read the sponsor agreements with research sites and CROs by Goldfarb in depth. Thanks.